Hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. This is the August 2019 TVC Power Hour. We'll be talking about working with the Coordinate System Manager utility. That's a supplement utility used across uh, Trimble and Trimble Geospatial products, in particular TVC and Trimble Access. Uh, I am your um, very brief co-host, uh, Joe Blecka, working with TBC here with Trimble in Westminster, Colorado. Um, happy to be joined today by our resident expert in Coordinate System Manager, our partner with Frontier Precision, Neil, up in Alaska. Glad to hear that and see that the internet is working in Alaska today. We had some issues with it, some prep runs earlier today. And Neil, thank you for joining us, especially early in the morning. Yeah, you're welcome, Joe. It's a pleasure to be on today and uh, presenting to other people who uh, find Coordinate System Manager interesting and uh, <laughs> want to learn how to use uh, use it to uh, full effect and uh, you know make it a you know a integral part of their workflow. So um, we'll jump right into it. There's a lot to cover today. Um, as you may know, uh, Coordinate System Manager has kind of been this uh, built-in utility with TBC. Um, and uh, we've got a few little announcements to go over on that. Um, but the other things we're going to jump over is uh, the fundamentals of map projections. Um, we're not going to go too deeply into this, um, but I, I want to go over some basics with people. Um, I'm also going to go into a uh, demonstration of how, uh, you know, seeing how coordinate system manager is organized, how you can navigate it, and also how you can organize things um, to make it, uh, you know, finding and selecting your coordinate system much quicker and more efficient. We're also gonna create a custom uh, coordinate system, which is actually gonna be a low distortion projection. That is actually the reason why I, I started digging so deeply into CSM was I had a lot of requests to build LDP uh, definitions into CSM for my customers here in Alaska. And we're also gonna briefly touch on how to add a datum and a geoid model and how those are applicable. And then I wanna use the custom CS and TBC and access. Um, since uh, you know we are US based, uh, we are gonna to touch a bit on the uh, modernization of the National Spatial Reference System here in the US and uh, because it's a direct tie into what I'm gonna to cover today. And then we'll have a little bit of time at the end for questions and answers. And we've also have uh, some resources for you to check out and uh, what to do next. So, um, Joe, if you want to take this, you can kind of, you've got a good uh, little uh, uh, coverage of the what CSM is. Sure. Yeah, so an introduction for those of you um, who may be new or just getting started with us and, and the Trimble Geospatial Solution. Um, the Coordinate System Manager, as we mentioned, is a little standalone utility um, that you can use to manage uh, pre-built and then custom, and you'll go through all this um, coordinate systems, local sites, datums, ellipsoids, and geoid models. Um, it's used across the uh, Trimble products. Today we'll be focusing on TBC and the Trimble Access field software. Um, in the past, it had been included uh, with the TBC download and still will be included as a part of the uh, TBC package. But big announcement, huge news, uh, available as of today. Uh, it is available as a standalone download. Um, it's included in the TBC package that you're already running, or it's been added to the TBC support page there, um, the utilities licensing and installation support. Um, before we get started here, and hopefully you're frantically scribbling down that URL, um, we will make
definitions here. So uh, the great thing about Lambert is that it, it does really well with the areas that are short and wide, you know, very oriented east-west. Um, it does a great job of uh, perf uh, preserving uh, directions because it is a conical projection. So it's it fits nice and tightly over top of your uh, your more or less your your latitudes and longitudes. East west directions are very true. Um, and going forward, um, the two parallel um, because of the state plane coordinate system is you know, geez, close to seventy years old, uh, or sorry, ninety years old. That uh, they're actually going to discontinue using the two parallel, or the, yes, the two parallel in the uh, NAD 2022 definitions, because mathematically you can actually write a, a two parallel as a one parallel and vice versa. So that's going to be discontinued from the NGS, and it's definitely a prop, a popular uh, projection to use for low distortion projections. The next one we're going to jump into here is a are your Mercator projections, specifically the transverse Mercator and oblique Mercator. Uh, a true Mercator projection would be east, uh, east-west east oriented. And we already know that um, Lambert does a better job at that. So Mercators are usually uh, used in, in locations for transverse for areas that uh, run uh, north-south. Um, and the oblique would be for something that that isn't really in a good cardinal direction and has a rotation to it. So here in Alaska, the bulk of our zones, we have 10 zones up here. It's a pretty big uh, state. Um, and uh, we've got, uh, they're all Mercator based, mostly transverse Mercator. Mercator. Uh, Southeast Alaska is actually an oblique Mercator. And then the Aleutian Islands, which is the large chain of islands that string you know, towards Japan, uh, are east-west and they're actually a Lambert, but I work in transverse Mercator a lot. Um, it's 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 all right. Uh, it doesn't do a great job of preserving direction though. Um, distances are all right, but uh, the further away you get from, um, I'm, I believe everyone can see my cursor, but the further away you get from your uh, where your um, where the mapping plane intersects your ellipsoid. Uh, kind of uh, creates difficulties uh, uh, pretty quickly. So just something to touch on here is I've got these tangent secant lines here. Um, typically, uh, the, these transverse and oblique Mercator and even the Lamberts, obviously a uh, state plane coordinate system existing, mostly going to be secant. These can also be defined as a tangent plane. Um, and as you can see, the problem is, is if we look here and you know, say we're measuring this slice here, we'll call this the center of the projection. But you can see that if we're secant and we're at the mapping plane, you know, it's a very short distance. Whereas if you get up to the ground, it could be much longer, and vice versa, depending on where your ground is relative to uh, to your uh, ellipsoid. And then of course our ellipsoid distance doesn't match either. So it's not very well optimized for use in surveying and engineering. Uh, type of work because we need something a little bit tighter. Um, you know, there's a typically, you know, just a grid scale factor for the, for the map. That's this 0.999. And when these were designed, they took into, they did not take into account elevation. So if you're down in Colorado, like Joe, where you're 5,000 feet above sea level, you're going to get a ton of distortion because the ellipsoid, um, despite it being, you know, optimized for North America, you're going to get quite a bit of separation there. And you're, I know that uh, from my friends that work down there and my brief time working there, that when you're 5,000 feet above sea level, the, the grid to ground uh, issue is real. So moving on, um, really where this uh, whole power hour idea and where it came in was when I got uh, asked to um, create a library of the low distortion projections that we use here in Alaska for uh, the Alaska DOT. The main purpose of a low distortion projection is to minimize distortion in the mapping plane to where the differences, you know, the distance and direction between grid and ground are barely noticeable. Um, there is no real official definition. That's just what I came up with the top of my head. And there's no real uh, more or less a definition of, of what the criteria is for 
for distortion. Typically, we measure this distortion in parts per million, um, plus or minus. And really what you want to do is, is uh, I've heard a couple definitions where it's like, oh, it's got to be 10 parts per million. Oh, it's got to be 25 or 20. For today, I'm just calling it less than 20. And I have seen some uh, seen some distortion maps where it gets up there around 25, 26, but it's mostly in higher elevation areas without population so or infrastructure, so it's not a big deal. So people, you know, I, I'm a land surveyor. Um, I work with a lot of land surveyors and it's, uh, you know, why should I use an LDP, right? Um, why, what's wrong with our current zones? Well, if you think about something where you're doing a large section of highway, say 10 or 20 miles, um, rebuilding it, uh, repaving it, etc. If you are using a, a scale factor and you're at a uh, with just a default uh, state plane coordinate system or even UTM, you know if we're losing say one foot in a thousand feet and we have thousands of feet of roadway and we're talking about uh, uh, areas and volumes when it comes to quantities and, and you know pay schedules that's a lot of money in the end, right? We could be talking millions of dollars. So there is definitely a drive to minimize distortion so that more people can use uh, mapping projections. And the other thing is too, is if you really wanna have a good challenge is explain the difference between grid and ground and how to, how to um, uh, account for that to the layman. Most, I, I don't think, uh, in most instances, and even other engineering professions I've, I've worked with, it's not understood that just because you have a coordinate system that's on a global or, or national scale, um, most people aren't aware that there's a lot of error and distortion in those. In those, so you know, it's it's this is where we're at and where we need to be. And um, I've seen huge errors uh, when checking data where somebody's gone out and uh, We've been given a um, uh, a grid system to lay out a large building, and you know the architect uh, did it in um, our actually structural engineer did it all in ground, but they preserved the state plane coordinates, and of course they they were they weren't even aware that they were using uh, you know state plane coordinates as the basis, and then uh, you know we've had we had some error or some busts in there because. Uh, because of the scale factor. So there's just a lot of uh, chances for, uh, uh, for, for problems. So what we have here with a low distortion projection, we're kind of getting rid of that secant and we're getting rid of that tangent uh, projection on the ellipsoid, or actually I should say secant tangent to the ellipsoid. We're, we're getting rid of those. What we're gonna do is we're optimizing the parameters so that we can, when we bring, um, you know, this is the non-intersecting mapping plane now, but what we're getting is very minimal error between grid and ground at this level because we are essentially moving the map mapping plane up by um, optimizing the parameters, be it the false northern and easting, the central meridian, uh, the scale factor, et cetera, to the location where we're working. And, uh, I'll just jump onto my next slide here. So another example would be, uh, this is Iowa. This is their old um, state plane coordinate system of 1983. And this map, uh, Joe, can everybody see my cursor here? Yes, we can. Okay. So in this map, you can see that the bulk of uh, the two zones that cover Iowa are very high distortion. Uh, the dark blue, is right here in the in the middle, you know, the lighter blue. We're at 80 to 100 parts per million. That's that's here in this, uh, you know, outer band. So I would say the bulk of these zones are uh, 60 parts per million or more. And uh, I figured 80 was actually a good average for this map because, uh, you know, that's uh, it just gets rid of these little bands here. Actually, the best place I guess to survey with less distortion in Iowa would be at the edge of your zones, which really doesn't make much sense because it's, right. uh, yeah, it creating problems. So both of these are Lambert, uh, two parallel Lambert conformal conic projections. They are secant to the ellipsoid. And if we were to average this out at uh, 80 parts per million, 
we'd be losing half a foot in a mile near pretty close and that which is eight centimeters in kilometer so things can start going out of whack pretty quick and it doesn't really serve people very well um, to use this uh, for a lot of things so if we go to the new projections which i think have been officially uh, adopted is what you can see is we've gone and we've broken it down into smaller zones that cover these various counties um, so each county could reference which zone they are in. Um, it follows administrative boundaries, which is great. And uh, as you can see now, our, our biggest, uh, actually right here, our, our maximum uh, distortion is plus 25.9 parts per million or minus 25.9 parts per million. So already we've kind of, you know, we're about a third of what the old distortion was at the, you know, as an average is now the maximum. So that is the one thing with low distortion is you definitely have to shrink the size of your zones. Um, in this case, you can see that, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, we're at very low distortion um, and the case has been made and it's been successful in a lot of places where when you, uh, especially at the, you know, at the state level, whoever defines these, um, by using these administrative boundaries, it works very well because if you think about it here in the US anyway, most of our cadaster in terms of, you know, the boundaries and, uh, you know, our PLSS, uh, um, uh, our quadrangles and our townships and everything, generally those all make up these counties and administrative boundaries. So when it comes elevation scale factor the further away you move from your mapping plane and your ellipsoid in either direction you're introducing elevation scale factor so long story short um, the new zones will actually um, and 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 these LDPs essentially really account for the elevation scale factor in terms of creating your parts per million and when I say parts per million so you know if we are say at uh, 20 parts per million that would be uh 
let's see here. Uh, oh, it's too early to do math, but we're, you know, uh, just for, for example, uh, one in 10,000 would be 100 parts per million. So we're drastically uh, knocking down that, uh, that scale factor from 0.999 to what, 0.9999975-ish. So we're really just pushing things out. I hope that answers that question. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay. All right, now we'll jump into the demonstration. I'll um, jump in here. So I, I decided to change my, uh, my uh, wallpaper today on my desktop to something that was uh, an image that was very relevant. This is a, uh, a picture I came across a few years ago of uh, a guy in uh, so a Hot Springs, South Dakota, this Professor Orlando Wilson who created this awesome flat earth concept. Um, and of course we know that's just not true now. We've kind of been to space and uh, I know <laughs> that if you're on this call, you're probably relying a lot on satellites that orbit our, our spheroid um, here that we call earth. So anyway, jumping in here, um, when you install TBC, uh, Coordinate System Manager, there's actually going to be a direct link to it. It's going to be under your, uh, when you go to your start menu and under your programs, it's get right under Trimble Office here. So I'll fire up Coordinate System Manager. I've actually thrown it on the the uh, my taskbar as well for today. But uh, I'll just expand things out. And uh, this is Coordinate System Manager. So it's a standalone utility uh, that you can use. You can open it. Uh, you can actually... I'll show you where this is actually at. The CSD file is actually located in C program data, Trimble, Geodata. And there's actually, I've had a whole bunch of backups because I changed it a lot. But this is where Coordinate System Manager automatically points to. And there's this CSD file. And actually, if you go in there and click that, it'll also open it. You can also send this CSD to a friend. So if you made a really cool coordinate system, you can send them your CSD and they can open it up and use it. So in here, it's, pretty, it's a pretty basic and logical layout. We have coordinate systems, local sites. Local sites, these would be your site calibrations or, um, you know, keyed in local sites where you've applied, uh, you know, say more like a modified state plane zone. Actually, the ones I have keyed in here are actually modified state plane zones. We also have datums. <clears throat> this is actually... Um, where you can go in and actually uh, create uh, transformation parameters between, um, you know, WGS84 um, and uh, say a, another ellipsoid like GRS80 to account for the 2011 shift. Um, don't recommend doing it unless you really know what you're doing, but you can change that. Ellipsoids, uh, you can create your own ellipsoid, but I would stay out of here. Um, there's not much to do in here. <laughs> And then also geoid models. So it's it's pretty basic. And as you can see in here, we have a lot of geoid models. But what we'll do here is uh, let's just go into, into here and let's uh, hide some records. So the one thing that people often complain to me about is, you know, we're in the United States. When I go into TBC and I select my coordinate system under project settings, is that I got to scroll way down here to get to the United States. Well, this is really handy. So when you open up Coordinate System Manager for the first time, I might actually say, I'm never going to work in Argentina. If you right click on the group, it will hide it. And it'll say these uh, other things will be affected. I just go OK. And now Argentina is gone from this list. Um, if I want to get it back, I just go to View, and I can tap, and it'll show me my hidden records. So you can go in here and actually hide all of the countries and coordinate systems you will not use just to make your life a little bit easier. This CSD file um, stays native. So if you, um, unless you uninstall TBC using the cleanup utility uh, and wipe everything all the way, but this will, this CSD will actually be upgraded every time that you update TBC or even update uh, coordinate system manager. So I highly recommend hiding a lot of these groups at first start up just so it can it makes things getting to things a lot easier so in here um you know these are all predefined these hard um dark filled in uh folders with the coordinate systems what i've done here is i actually created a group and to create a group it's actually pretty simple i can actually go here 
get the drop down box and I can create a new group. So what I could say is uh, TBC power hour group or um, which is going to go in alphabetically um, or I could call it, uh, you know, my LDPs, whatever you want. Um, this will show up when people are selecting the project. And why you'd want to use this one and not the 2011 but then we can go in here and we can actually go and select whatever type of uh, projection we want to use so uh, in this case maybe it's an oblique marketer um, we can go in and key all these parameters and I'll actually jump back out to my other one if there's a shift grid uh, associated with it we could use that um, I have not kind of used shift grids at all in my life so I'm not the most knowledgeable guy on shift grids. And then we can also define a geoid model. So anyway, what I'll do here is I'm going to jump into this Alaska Highway one. Um, so this is, I just went keyed in the name. Uh, the export name automatically populates. And then my datum name is, just, or I used uh, NAT83 Alaska for this. And now if I go here into my projection, I select my oblique mercator. I have to key in a, a central latitude and longitude, a false northern and easting. The big thing here is if you're, uh, if, if it's given to you, I'll go back to my little text file here. It was originally given to me in feet. Um, unfortunately, uh, this would just be a dream of mine, make things easier, but uh, coordinate system manager does require you to, to key in the false northern and easting in meters. So if you get it in feet, make sure you know it's US survey feet.
the, that map that you showed of Iowa um, is is quite good. Um, do you have any any struggles or, or uh, thoughts on the LDPs with high uh, of elevation deltas? Um, yeah, that is always going to be a problem. Um, going from say a thousand feet above sea level to 7,000. I mean, that's, uh, those are, that's actually a huge mountain range there. Um, it actually would contain the largest peak in North America along that, which is, uh, which is Denali, which is like 20,000 feet. So four miles high. Um, you are going to still have distortion at those peaks. So the one little point I should have made about LDPs is that they're definitely optimized for where the infrastructure is, where people live, where it's habitable and usable land. And you would all of a sudden start getting very high distortions at the tops of peaks. But fortunately, we're probably not building anything up there. So that that is one thing that we can never really uh, account for is massive uh, elevation changes. So anyway. So just jumping back into here, um, we've had an azimuth rotation of minus 52, and the azimuth origin is at the center of projection. So these three toggles here, I would say this is going to be your default. With the first one, if you're having issues, I'll show you how to test these. But the origin location will be the one that's questionable. Um, is it at the uh, center of the projection or the center of the equator? And really, the tell would probably be in, be in your false northern east things, a very low number something not in the millions probably at the center of projection origin location if it's at the equator obviously these are in the millions so these would be at the uh for this it's at the equator um again uh and uh, rather than key this all and i figured i'd show you i'll also show you another couple that are quick um again no shift grid model and then you also want to define which geoid you're using in this case i've used 12b so that's our oblique mercator um, I'll jump in here, and this one's another one I keyed in. This is the Dalton Highway Zone 1. This starts at the North Slope at the Arctic Ocean, and it's a transverse mercator. Um, these are pretty easy because it's really north-south. There's not too many parameters. It's central latitude, longitude, false northeasting, and a scale factor. Um, for folks uh, in the southern hemisphere, yes, you can actually go and change this to uh, any of these to where it's a south azimuth. And then also, if you were to go with a positive direction, you can actually change this, you know, uh, say a, a, a society that reads from the right. I've seen some funky things that have come to me over the years from my friends that work all over the world where, you know, positive goes uh, south and west. So you could actually, you know, if you had something quirky, you could actually use, use those two. But that's a transverse mercator in terms of uh, the parameters. And... Um, uh, this next zone is actually Lambert. So this this whole stretch of highway stre uh, all uh, basically transfers to a Mercator. So this is just a Lambert conformal conic one parallel. Um, the one thing to note is uh, you can change this to a two parallel if somebody gives you a two parallel projection. Um, I know in some competing softwares it only let you do a two a two parallel um, Lambert, um, which I hope that for the for the competing software they change that but you can actually go and fudge in a two parallel into a one parallel generally by uh just keying in um the central latitude and longitude into one field but um those are really the three main ones so whenever you go in here and add or change a uh, coordinate system the big thing you want to do is here is hit save so now all of a sudden our parameters are saved and we don't have anything um uh you know just uh, i i've gone here made changes not saved and been like why isn't my my deal updating so that's really it for coordinate system manager um the one thing about it is we're going to go into the testing now and also how to uh export this to access and uh, i guess joe could could we kind of talk about this that we're we've we've discussed having different export formats and imp also the ability to import yeah, so um, if you've been uh, uh, with us in the TBC world for the last couple of years, you can tell that we've um, very committed to the software and the platform, and, and we've increased the functionality here exponentially. And so we're always looking to make these tools a little bit more uh, usable and accessible 
to you. So um, additional enhancements um, are, are always um, in plan. And you know, actually, while um, Neil was talking there, I just added you know the ability to do that uh, meters to feet conversion uh, automatically. That's an that's an easy one. We can um, maybe knock off here pretty soon, but. Um, if there are, uh, I got a question here. If there are um, your your country or your region here missing, and you're using TBC software, you can um, use published values like Neil just showed you to to, to key it in yourself here. Uh, if you want TBC or Coordinate System Manager to ship with your um, uh, specific geoid you use or a coordinate system that's not in there, um, you can contact me or your local Trimble rep and get those parameters to us and we can build them in. Um, we just, for example, added um, support for the local uh, grid systems that a high-speed rail, the high-speed uh, two rail project in the UK is adding. So we can go out everything from, from country based down to you know, specific uh, project base uh, if the demand is there. Um, bringing us back to what Neil was talking about, um, making our coordinate systems and TBC and access um, interoperable with other common um, platforms, Esri, for example, and the, the PRJ is a really common um, um, file format to store these these objects. Um, we are looking at that, in, in, as well as uh, uh, LAN XML um, uh, uh, interoperable opportunities as well. So, um, just because what you see here. Uh, is, is what you get today. It doesn't mean that it's static by by any means. And if you have enhancements, um, please let us uh, let us know about. Yeah. So being able to exchange these is going to be huge going forward because I see more and more people creating custom coordinates of systems. So one thing just before we jump into TBC here that I forgot to mention was you can also add um, it, when it comes to datums. I promise the uh, the natty. Translation parameters from a reliable source, but you can actually key these in and create a new file that does that transformation. But my typically, typically when I work with people, I recommend for the for the sake of keeping things sane and simple, is I'll say just use your um, your uh, default uh, sorry NAT83 um, transformation and and work in your what we call local coordinates, which would be GRS 80 derived NAT 83 latitudes and longitudes. So that's my that's my hard recommendation is use use local and just work always in your NAT 83 and don't worry about figuring out all of the transformations to WGS 84 in the background. And then the last thing I want to do is I'm just going to add a custom geoid model. I know we're starting to crunch on time here, but I be, I have a um, um actually I got to close this quick. But what I have here is I made a, uh, we've got, currently we have these experimental geoid models. And I made a experimental geoid model for uh, an area that that covers what we have for data for Alaska. So it's this X-geoid uh, uh, 17B. And I just threw that, if you have these GGFs or make these GGFs, uh, again, all this data goes into C, program data, Trimble geodata. So I go in there, I go and add this, and I can call it X Geoid 17B Alaska. And then I can go in here, scroll way down, 
and then there's my xgeoid file and I can basically create that and that's actually selectable and definable in other coordinate systems. I could actually use this in TBC, so I'll just save that right now. So um, just to move things along here, we'll jump into TBC now. Um, in here, I've actually already created a new project as testing, but I'll, I'll go ahead. So I've opened up TBC. I'm just gonna create a new project. This uh, particular data set that I have, Um, I call 12B a, a survey quality, despite some of its issues. But uh, yes, we got NAVD88 finished. So now I've gone and created this, uh, or I've, I've defined my coordinate system as that uh, custom keyed in one. I'm just gonna hit okay. And then the, what I'll do here is just to, as a demonstration, I'm gonna go and drag and drop this uh, local, um, these local coordinates, which are latitude and longitude. And it's going to ask me for an import and I actually created this custom uh, import format editor that knows that uh, I've got I'm bringing in despite my project being in feet I've actually told it by creating a custom uh, uh, a custom import format that the uh, ellipsoid heights I'm bringing in are meters so it'll automatically do the conversion for me I'll just hit say import and boom here are all of our, these are a series of control points along the highway. And as you can see here, you know, I can go in, I can see my northern easting elevation. There's my, my uh, local coordinate that I recommend you using. And just for the, just for grins, what I'll do here is rather than going to the testing, I'll actually change this. So I can go in here because I brought these in as latitude and longitudes, I can actually change these to any other projection I want. Um, so I'll go here coordinate system and zone. And I know that these are in US state plane, Alaska zone three. Next, finish.
And now I have this .job file, which I can use in access. But what I'm actually gonna do here is a little hack that I learned a few years ago, is if I rename this from a .job to a .jot, I can make this a selectable template in Trimble Access. So actually, wrong folder. Um, so in Trimble Access, the big thing is you'll have in the in the newer version of Access, you'll obviously have uh, you know common files, projects, and system files. Um, you're going to want to go and drag and drop this .jot into your system files folder. Um, be it on your TSC3, your TS, uh, or your TSC7, or whatever you may be using for a data collector, pop it on there. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to open up. I'm in Access. I've got a uh, a project started. I'll create a new job here, and all of a sudden now, boom! I have an Alaska Highway job, and I'll call this um, TBC PH demo. And I'll just hit enter, I'll create this, boom. It will prompt you for a project height. And I know in this, in this uh, area that I'm working, I'm working in, uh, or you know, I've got uh, US survey feet. Let's, let's just look again to see what our, our elevations are around 13 to 1500. I'm just gonna go 1400 for now. Um, that should work fine as a project height. And it's gonna throw me this error saying I can't find this GGF file. So I'm gonna have my vertical adjustment and I actually don't have a geoid model in here right now. So what I'm gonna do is go back to my geodata. I'm gonna to go to, uh, my apologies on this. This was the one thing I didn't do. I'm gonna to go to my Trimble Data shortcut and I'll just pop this into system files quick. This geodata folder that Neil's showing ships with Coordinate System Manager um, access does not ship with the full complement library here. So that's what Neil's doing. He's bringing um, the referenced uh, geoid into where Trimble Access can access it. Yeah. So, yeah. So now that I've created this job template, it was selectable. I've created the job, and here's all my control points for the project. Um, if I was to do one thing, I would probably would have knocked out all those grid values in there. from Coordinate System Manager uh, into Trimble Access? Oh, the, uh, not today. I actually don't like using it because I've had errors with it. So I'll, uh, I'd like to pass on that question for today. Okay. Let's see. Um, yeah. So what I'm, what I'm talking about and how um, Coordinate System Manager can be used across TBC and, and Trimble Access is that that CSD file, as long as it has, or that CSD file can be read in Trimble Access as well, as long as you have those supporting files, like you eventually get prompted, hey, you don't have a, your coordinate system oh. for a geoid, Trimble Access can't find it, copy over those those files as well into the system files folder that Trimble Access is reading from. So the, right. the .job or the .jot, the Trimble Access job file or the job file template is a very valid approach to um, getting coordinate systems back and forth between the office and the field as well as using and leveraging this um, CSD file and supporting you know, geoid files or, or data transfer. Right. right. The reason I like the .jot is because it is so custom and you want to do a lot of testing is it's just one of those places where I find that uh, uh, back in my five years ago when I was you know, a senior surveyor at a private company, it was definitely a thing where it could get screwed up quick. So if you're a survey manager on here, I would recommend the .jot uh, approach. 
And uh, if you're more of a power user, maybe a single surveyor, then yeah, the CSD would actually be a very good valid way to use. And I actually thought you said CSV earlier, but you, but that's oh, not. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no worries, still early here. So um, yeah, so you could dra drag and drop that CSD into your system files folder as well and use that. So I guess that just brings up the uh, kind of our next uh, spot here. I'll go to my presentation again is, well, oh, I didn't want to start from that side. Sorry. Save everyone the, where am I here? No, that's not it. Um, yes, tackle it. I forget where that uh, button is. So there's two other related power hours that I'd like to point people towards. Um, there was a July 2017, which is a hotly uh, um, attended uh, webinar uh, power hour that I actually attended, which was great, which is the defining and working with grid and ground coordinates in TBC and access. And then also the November 2017, which was working with seven, uh, site calibrations and local settings in TBC. These both tie directly into coordinate system manager. And you can actually store local sites in, uh, in coordinate system manager that are selectable. So um, those are great things to, to, uh, to check out uh, in terms of recordings. Uh, you can just go and Google TBC Power Hour Vault and that'll get you there. And then the other place too is if you're learning, want to learn more about low distortion projections, building a state plane coordinate system for the future, these are all webinars that were done by the uh, National Geodetic Survey. Um, and search NGS webinar series. These were all done by Michael Dennis and I think more than likely, I'll be honest, I actually stole a couple of illustrations from him. A great guy, and he's really been a proponent to making state plane coordinate systems more user friendly and uh, cycle so every five years we're going to get a readjustment new parameters new values to uh to basically go between say gps and maps so we'll be able to you know it'll just be it'll be on a nice increment um personally i was i was for a fully dynamic um um north american terrestrial reference frame but again i'm a power user and then there's going to be every 10 years, there will be a big update. Um, and I forget all the details on that. There's a lot of information out there. But just like I was saying with these low distortion projections, our state plane coordinate system zones will be optimized uh, to minimize distortion. And we'll also be getting a gravity potential geoid model, um, which is huge because we've been using hybrids lately and those have their issues. Um, and that's, an, that's a tangent for another day. Maybe I could do a power hour in another year that where we talk a bit more about elevations. But the big thing I want to say here is I know that Tribble is strongly committing to making sure that, uh, you know, life is easy for its users uh, on this. 
when I was at this geospatial summit back in May, um, I ran into what there's six people from Trimble. And of the other two major competitors, there was one person. So I know as a, a dealer and also somebody that's been a user for a long time, I, I have a lot of confidence in Trimble that, you know, that we're, we're going to have, a, you know, Joe's going to have a solution. And, you know, me as a dealer, we're going to have solutions for you and we're going to know how to handle this transformation. We want to make your life easy. So any Joe, any other thoughts? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that um, endorsement. And, and it is something that we at Trimble here do are, are taking very, very seriously. Um, and really our, our developers and our experts in the field across the world um, are, are already um, in earnest working on, on making the 2022 uh, transition um, for our North American users smooth, you know, making it accessible to the everyday surveyor and also balancing having the, the data and the backbone to kind of back that up for, for users such as Neil that want to dive further in into the data and moving back and forth now here with this um, you know time uh, dimension uh, being added as well. So um, for our non-North American users, this will um, result in some improvements for you as well because at the foundation of this is to be able to support time-dependent transformations, um, which is what we're working on right now um, kind of building that foundation um, within the coordinate system manager and some other utilities to be able to support them in Trimble Access and PVC. Um, that's kind of a kind of a development snapshot where we're at right now. Um, you should be seeing things well in advance along the lines of uh, time-dependent transformation support ahead of 2022. So yeah, just to reiterate, um, do not uh, be too worried about this. This is there are some substantial changes coming. Um, the NGS has continually called um, and, and run a, a robust outreach program. So if you have thoughts or you want to learn more, um, there's a couple of three documents that they've put together um, that really explain it well. They've really documented this. They're jumping out ahead of it, engaging both the industry partners like Trimble as well as end users. They really want to hear from you um, as well. So if you've got thoughts on this, I would encourage you to, to follow this URL or, or just look up the NGS there, ngs.noaa.gov, um, to, to learn more. And they, like I said, they're looking for active feedback um, uh, along uh, a lot of these new tools and uh, really fundamental changes that are coming. Thank you, Joe. And uh, just be assured I am a TBC beta tester, and being that I'm more into the geodetic side of things, I will be testing the crap out of the uh, for the time dependent transformation. So we'll make sure it's it's dialed in before uh, you need to use it. So um, any questions that popped up, Joe? I know we're running late, um, but I could probably field a couple if there's uh, if there's if uh, there's a couple that are very pertinent. Yeah, there there are. Um, there's two in particular. Um, Matt asked early on um, if you're you're making modifications to um, uh, your coordinate system managers, for example, you're adding a coordinate system. Um, is there a way to export just your modification or is it best to export um, that whole CSD to, um, to share with a colleague or a, a client? I would export your whole CSD um, because I can actually go. The great thing is too is just because we don't have a, a solid import method yet, is if I go into my geodata folder, I'll just go in here quick. I can actually open it up, open up um, multiple instances of Coordinate System Manager. So I can open up multiple CSDs. Actually, that's an old one, yada, yada. And then I can open my current, but I can actually open up, yeah, multiple CSDs at once. So I can copy and paste uh, between, oh, there it finally opened up, let me, so I can copy and paste between the two of them. So I would use that. Um, you could export uh, a, uh, actually, uh, selected records only. We could export this as a CSW and take the parameters from there, but I would say um, share with them your CSD. And you can rename these whatever. The big thing is, is TBC, when you open up Trimble Business Center, it's always gonna look for this current.csd in your Trimble data folder. 
and you can specify a for Trimble Access to read that. I've been long enough out of the field, I had forgotten to mention that um, for Trimble Access to read the CSD. Yes, that's, that is one thing too that I, yeah, I actually forgot about that as well, Joe. And I've actually been going with the job template for so long that yeah. it, just, it just made more sense to do the job template for keeping things from getting messed up.
thought. By no means did I have training on Coordinate System Manager. I've probably spent, you know, 10, 12 hours just fooling around in there because I always have that bug of being curious. Um, as you probably saw in my geodata, there's lots of backup files that are generated. So don't ever be afraid of messing up. Try things. Um, I have tons of junk jobs. Don't be afraid to just step out of your comfort zone and try something new, especially when it comes to these coordinate systems. It's you can screw them up, but there's enough backup there that you can undo and and be comfortable. So that's how I learned, and that's how I recommend anyone learn. So with that, you know, have a great day. And uh, anything else, Joe? Or are we good? I think we're good. Thank you, Neil. I really appreciate your time and expertise here. You're welcome. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.